one of the basic principles of insight or clear seeing is that all compounded or all fabricated things are inconstant. They don't last. They waver. They change. And as someone once said, so what else is new? Things change. If that's all there was to the Buddha's insight, there wouldn't be much to it. But it goes deeper than that. It's not just that things change, but things change in line with their conditions. And you want to be able to see that changing in line with their conditions. In other words, to see that this arises when that arises, this ceases when that ceases. And again, that's not much of an insight until you realize that we're also trying to feed in those areas where things arise and pass away. We're looking for our happiness there. And if we look for our happiness in these things in and of themselves, we're going to be disappointed. And if we can't figure out the pattern, we're going to be neurotic. They talk about a test they gave to some pigeons one time. They put them in a box, and there was a green lever and a red lever. And sometimes when you push the green lever, you get food, and sometimes when you pushed it, you wouldn't get food. And sometimes when you push the red lever, you get food, and sometimes you wouldn't. And they compare these birds with another set of birds, which were put in a box where it was very clear that there was a pattern to when you would get food from the green lever and when you would get food from the red lever. The birds in the second box were perfectly normal. The birds in the first box went crazy. For two reasons. One was that the only way they were going to get food was by pressing levers. And yet they couldn't figure out when it was going to work and when it wasn't going to work. And it drove them into distraction. So as long as we're looking for food in things that arise and pass away, we've got to find the pattern of how we're going to get good food for the mind. This is part of the Buddha's other insight, that even though some things arise and pass away and can't give an ultimate happiness in and of themselves, they do function as a path, and other things don't. This is the pattern that he wants us to see. What's skillful, what's unskillful. So we look to inconstancy not just to see how things arise and pass away, but how we can learn how to manipulate the process so we can actually find the food that we want and ultimately, of course, get to the point where we don't need food anymore. But the only way you get to that point is by feeding on the right things. So when you start out meditating and you see that states in your mind are arising and passing away, you're already dealing in what's called the frame of reference of mental qualities in and of themselves. Even though your focus is on the breath, you can't help but notice there are times when the mind is concentrated and there are times when it's not. And you've got to learn how to figure out both issues. Which are the things that are getting in the way that you've got to learn how to get rid of, and which are the things that are actually going to help you, which you've got to encourage. So even though we're focusing on the breath as our primary frame of reference, there is this other frame of reference going on at the same time. You have to learn how to recognize what are the hindrances and what are the factors for awakening. The hindrances are the primary set of unskillful qualities. The factors for awakening are the, the skillful ones. 
fact, the factors of awakening are the ones that get you started on this path to begin with, of sorting things out. Once you're mindful, say, of the breath, you begin to see there are skillful and unskillful qualities arising in the mind. You've got to learn how to distinguish them. That's called analysis of qualities. And then there's the effort to do away with the unskillful ones and to encourage the skillful ones. Right there you've got the first three of the factors for awakening. You want to encourage that ability to observe your mind. Because even though you're trying to stay with the breath and trying to stay focused on the breath, you're not going to be able to do it unless you've got these other faculties helping you along. As John Lee explains it, analysis of qualities is directly connected with directed thought and evaluation, which are factors of jhana. Those are things you need to help you get into the meditation, get in with the breath. So again, you're dealing with two different frames of reference right there the body in and of itself, and these mental qualities in and of themselves. So when the hindrances arise, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety or uncertainty, your first duty is simply to recognize them for what they are, to see that they are hindrances and they are things that deserve to be let go. That right there is quite an accomplishment, because for the most part, when a hindrance arises, we're, we're already with it. We're on its side. Sensual desire comes along, and it's a good thing. We've got decades of Western psychology to prove that sensual desire can't be thwarted. If you thwart it, it turns into the thing and goes underground. At least that's what the mind tells itself when it decides it's going to go along with the desire. It has all kinds of reasons, but you've got to learn how to look past those. So, okay, what does this desire do to the mind? Again, it's not just watching it arise and pass away. You've got to see when it arises, what does it bring along with it? What does it do when it passes away? What's it like? And you begin to realize, okay, when it's there, it really does cloud up the mind. It creates a lot of disturbance, a lot of stress. It makes it impossible to stay with a breath. And you've got to decide whether you're on the side of it, the sensual desire, or on the side of the breath. The same goes with ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and anxiety, uncertainty and doubt. You've got to decide whether you're on their side or on the side of the breath. And the best way to decide is just to watch these things, step back from them. So when they come, what comes along with them? When they go away, what goes away? And when they come, why do they come? What intentions underlie them? Can you trust those intentions? At this stage in the practice, this is how you use the principle of inconstancy, not just watching things arise and pass away, arise and pass away. Because after all, you are trying to feed in these areas. What kind of food do the hindrances give? And if they give you bad food, okay, what can you do to clear them out of the mind? So it's not just the passive watching. You watch with a purpose. You want to get past these things. It's a similar principle with the factors for awakening. Once you've analyzed things and seen what's skillful and unskillful, you credit figure out why it is that the skillful qualities arise, when they're there, how you protect them, how you maintain them. And in John Fung's word, how you bakong, the Thai word bakong means how you sort of nurture them along, protect them, support them. So even though you know that they are inconstant, you try to 
use the principle of inconstancy, I seeing that they are caused by causes, conditions, and you try to nurture those conditions, because you know you're going to have to depend on them. These qualities are going to be your food on the path, the good kind of food that strengthens the mind. The Buddha compares the states of jhana to different kinds of food. You're off in a fortress at the edge of a frontier. The enemy is all around you, but you've got food in the fortress. So even though there's a siege by the enemy, you still can stay well-fed, strong, you can keep up the fight. You've got grass and water and all different kinds of good food, all the way up to the fourth jhana, which is compared to butter, ghee, sugar, and honey. And because they are good food, you don't just watch them arise and pass away. You do what you can to grow the food and then to keep the food. Because without it, the practice dies. It's only when you've used that food to strengthen your, your concentration, strengthen your insight, strengthen the tranquility of the mind, that you can get to the point where you, you've fully mastered that process of cause and effect. That's when you turn to look at it and see, well, how far does this take me? takes you only so far. It takes you close enough that you can actually reach the other shore, as they say. That's when you start looking at everything in terms of arising and passing away, and try to develop the dispassion that comes from not having to eat these things anymore. The Buddha uses the word nibbidha, which means disenchantment, but also disgust, distaste. You've had enough of that food. That's when you can let go of everything. That's when there's final release. That's when you treat all compounded things the same, whether they're obstacles or whether they're part of the path, because you don't need to feed anymore. The mind doesn't have any hunger. But as long as it still does have hunger, your approach to or your relationship to inconstancy is going to be different. You want to be like those healthy, well-adjusted pigeons. You know which lever gives food and which lever gives no food, or which lever gives good food and which lever gives bad food. You figure it out and you can really nurture yourself, really nourish yourself, and the mind stays strong. So there are many stages in this understanding of inconstancy. It's not just that, oh, I saw concentration last night and I let it go and that was it. What's next? That kind of insight goes nowhere. It's the insight that sees, oh, when it arises, it arises because of this. When it passes away, it passes away because of that. And then if it's a skillful quality, you want to nurture it. If it's unskillful qualities, you want to figure out the principal cause and effect so you can stay away. Let these things go, because you still need to feed properly. You've got to take care of yourself. You still have those duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. The path is to be developed. The cause of suffering or the causes of suffering are to be abandoned. And on that stage, you use the principle of inconstancy to figure out what are the causes and how do you keep them going, even though they are inconstant, if they're the causes for the path. It's only when you get to the end of the path that the duties change. And John Munn has an interesting point. He says there comes a point in the meditation where all Four Noble Truths are one. And what he means is they all have the same duty. 
whether it's stress or the path or whatever. It's all compounded, it's all in constant, it's all to be abandoned. But it's important as you practice that you know where you are in the practice and what the duties appropriate to that stage in the practice are. And that's how you use insight into inconstancy with wisdom and discernment. So the teaching fulfills its intended purpose.